to Yana TV. Thank you so much for watching us. Today our guest is Loretta Chen, a famed theater director and a woman with a remarkable life story. And in this short video, you're gonna learn how Loretta overcame all odds and censorship and staged a very controversial play Vagina Manologues in Singapore and how she overcame life's toughest lessons. Welcome, Loretta. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, and I know that you have been a director for more than a decade. Yes, yes. So Does it show my age? Yeah, okay. Oh, <laughs> I didn't have that fresh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what were you, what's your favorite place? You know, I read your book. Okay. okay. And the Thank two you. plays I wanted to ask about is the vagina monologues or the F word. So okay. which one would be your favorite and why? Between these two? Yes, between those two. Uh, I think every project is like a, a, a baby to, yeah. to a director. I think you birth a different baby. And uh, they, I, I love them both for very different reasons. Now, The Vagina Molox is very special because I think it's one of those first plays that is like a real kick-ass women sort of play that's written by Eve Ansler. Um, when I decided to direct it, um, I took a whole different approach and actually wrote to Eve Ansler and said, look, we can't have a monologue because first off, I think uh, women's stories need more drama. And also, I think in the original version, it only allows for three women. It's usually two white women, or one white woman, one black woman, and a Jewish woman. I it think tends I saw to it be once in yeah? New York. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it tends to be either uh, black, white, Jew, or two white women. But that sort of configuration. And first off, I told her if I was going to stage it in an Asian context, I'll need it done differently because it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different demographic. Uh, and actually, I I wrote to her and I said that I can't just have three women because I needed to have. Asian. I needed to have the, the Chinese, Malay, Indian, Eurasian, um, Caucasian. I needed to have the bigger size women, the heavy set women, the plump women, the shorter women, um, a lesbian woman, um, a transsexual woman. Uh, and I also had uh, like a, a variety, uh, an, an older woman, an old, an, an older, um, what we call the pioneer generation woman. So I actually insisted that we needed to have all that. And to my surprise, she actually said no. Um, and I thought that, mm, I was actually a little surprised because I thought for someone as progressive as, as Eve Ansler, I thought she would actually say yes. And I was surprised she said no, but I insisted on it. Um, and eventually I, I had my way. So I think our Vagina Monologues was a real departure from the original monologue version because there was song and dance and, dra and drama. I split up the lines um, amongst the women and it became like a dialogue. So what could have been said between by one person, the minute you give someone else to say it, like immediately the, the dynamic is different. It could have been, what was just one person's monologue, once you split it up, it could almost be a fight or it could be a, 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 a central conversation or it could be um, a, a business-like discussion. So I, I think the whole notion of just words in itself, when taken out of context, becomes a completely whole new dimension. I thought that was, in terms of directing, for me the most challenging and the most fun piece I've ever done because it was a, a canonical text that people recognized, but yet I did it in such a completely different way um, I think the audiences in Singapore and in um, Toronto, I do it, a couple other places loved it. And uh, I, I think it, 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 it really meant something for me as a, as a director and as a woman, as an artist. Uh, for Why the is that? Why did it mean something for you? Because I think it was a very powerful text in its heyday in the 90s when it was written, because no text uh, specifically addressed feminine issues. Um, that text was very powerful because it addressed the vagina in, in a way that was never done before because it addressed issues of marriage, love, hope, sex, um, giving birth, motherhood, um, rape, abuse in such a visceral way and what I did was I like, pushed it even more. So for example, instead of just talking about it like, oh I was abused by my husband, I actually got the women to enact the abuse like through not just like talking about it but like the abuse, like you saw it, like you saw what's happening to her. Um, and I thought that gave it a whole other dimension. And, and instead of just hearing the words, um, for example, it was a seduction scene. Instead of saying, like, you know, I, this, was, this is what he did to me. Instead of hearing it, I actually had them, like, uh, enact it. And it became very powerful when the words and the actions go together or when they don't go together. In fact, in one of the scenes that I love the most, it was a scene about abuse. And I had this woman talk about her abuse, like, oh my god, my, my husband like beat me up. It was so <laughs> fun. And, I, uh, and, uh, and it was very 
jarring because when people like listen to it, it's like, oh, how could that be fun? And I funny. think, funny, yes. How could the abuse be funny? And it made us realize, oh my God, it's actually it's not, not funny, because they were laughing. They were like, oh, oh, hold on, she's actually getting beat up, and it's actually not funny. And I think doing these sort of interesting takes on word and, and action gives a whole new dimension because most times we take a lot of things for granted um, and that's what I did. I, I, I played with people's perceptions of what is and what isn't and what's convention and what's not and I, I played with the distinction between text and action and it gave a whole new uh, flavor and meaning to, to, the, the, to the entire uh, production of Vagina Monologues. How was your experience of staging, actually, this? I mean, it I was know we're doing this in Singapore, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. choosing a play like that to stage yes. in Singapore, so yes. how was really the experience good question. of um, director? Let's just say it's very interesting because I had many phone calls with the powers that be. Uh, one of the interesting conversations I remember having was uh, they called to say, oh, Loretta, you know, uh, could we change the title of the play? And I was like, uh, sure. Uh, which word do you have a problem with? Is it the or is it <laughs> monologues? <laughs> and uh, they were like, uh, is the middle word. And I was like, what, vagina? Like, but it's a body part. Like, I could call it the nose monologues or the mouth monologues, but it's the vagina. So w where do you want me to change it? It's, it's a body part, you know? <laughs> And then there was one conversation I have to have, yeah. and then the other conversation was really That's funny. A good one. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> the other conversation that I have to had to have it was really fun. Oh, two other conversations. One was um, the design of my poster. I was being really cheeky and tongue in cheek. I had uh, my model model for me, so she had her legs outspread like that, like a V, and then I had her to sit this way, so it looks like an M. And uh, what I did, the first cut, I knew that they would call me up, right? But she was wearing a thong because obviously she has to wear a thong. Um, so I, I, I got it presented this way, very bare skin, but the thing is she had to put her finger where her thong is because she's wearing a thong, right? So I got her to put her finger there so it looks kind of sensual and all that. So I presented a poster as is. I mean, of course, I colored it and I knew they would call, but they called me for a completely different reason. This is really funny because when they called me, I thought they would call me to say, okay, Loretta, look, that your poster is too in your face. Like, you know, the, the V is just in my face. Like, I, I can't see the body part. So I thought they would call me because they thought it's too offensive. Okay, that's fine. But then when they called me, they said, oh, Loretta, uh, you know, we have a problem with your poster. I said, sure, like, tell me why. And I said, oh, you know, it's, it's um, where the woman's finger is strategically placed. So I thought, okay because it's too in your face. And I said, okay, you know, sure, why? And they said, oh, um, you know, it looks as if uh, she's um, pleasuring herself. <laughs> and it's really <laughs> funny, because I had never thought that the girl putting her finger there was, like, it, I didn't mean she was masturbating. I just meant that she had to protect her modesty because I was getting her to be modest. And it's funny and how the, came across completely and the, the authority saw it as like she was masturbating. I thought, wow, they're even more progressive than me. I thought I'm <laughs> progressive, but you guys are like even more progressive. So, so that was a funny story. Then later I... Did I, you have to turn it down? Yeah, yeah, but I actually made it really fun. I put lots of flowers, like at the Garden of Eden. Yeah. So basically what happened was that during that time, absolutely uh, really upset because first of all, these people I went to business with, um, I've, I've nothing against them till today. Honestly, I, I don't. Um, they were my friends. Um, first off, obviously the friendship ended. Uh, lots of stuff happened, which I don't want to talk about it on, on, on air, but if you read the book. Uh, but even then, I, I have no anger against them, because like I said, I went in with full trust. I did not look at the books. I did not, uh, I had full trust in them. It's also, I think it's, I also took accountability that I was too trusting. I never checked on their expenses, never checked on uh, anything. Uh, and then when I realized what was really happening, I think it was a devastating blow. So lots of stuff I had to deal with. And then during that time, as, as you rightly mentioned, my because I was so depressed, I spent so much time at home, and I realized my mother was not doing well. I took her to see the uh, neurosurgeon, and she was diagnosed with a tumor the size of a tennis ball, which, mean, which means she could just go anytime. And I think uh, when you're, you're hit with a crucible, I think things suddenly become very simple. What usually, s what might have seemed such a big challenge when posed with like your mother's mortality, it's like suddenly everything else didn't matter. The fact that everybody hates me, the fact that I was going through this horrible state of affairs, I've lost like the shirt off my back. All I wanted to do was to keep my mother alive. Of course. And that became like my sole purpose. Uh, and everything became very clear that I was just going to keep my mom alive. And I remember thinking that, um, oh my God, I'm going to tear. I remember thinking that um, if 
she left, I would let all my business partners go. I would let every single one of them go. And she's still alive today. You bargained with God. And I bargained with God, and um, I never, ever pursued them. I had a lawsuit going, uh, starting, and I retracted everything because we had enough evidence, but I retracted everything, everything. And my mom is still alive. So I truly believe in doing good and, and um, doing what, it, what feels right. Everyone else can scold me and say it's so stupid, you had all the you know, evidence, why didn't you just go ahead? But to me, what felt right was keeping my mom alive and um, I made a bargain with God and I honor that. And she wrote a book. And I wrote a book. And I just want to show the book because I have it. Yeah, because uh, you robbed me of my last book. It was my last book and she took it. Exactly. I said it's my last and book. And there is some... Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I wrote. And that are all kind of things yeah. in between. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. There was something in me that always kept me alive. I was always had this spirit that I, I think I really wanted to stay alive. Then I figured there must be a reason for me to stay alive. And then I woke up one day realizing that I wanted to honor this bit of grace and, and recognize that I think life is really worth living and that I need to make meaning out of a death. Because if I killed myself too, then that's it. I needed to somehow try and convert all this pain into something meaningful. Uh, then I started traveling a lot. But so at 24, I started traveling alone. So for 15 years, I've been doing that now. I've been traveling alone. Uh, and I go from place to place, uh, volunteering and working with different communities. And on two, maybe one of the instances that really stuck in my mind is when I volunteered in, in Cambodia. And here was I, depressed, like suicidal, upset. And then I, I go into this, uh, in Cambodia, where it's a camp for sex traffic workers, and they're, they're, they're girls. And they're young. And they're like young, really between young. 8 to 18. And uh, when I walked into the room, they're all really tense, which is uh, rare, because with girls are always so fun, and you know, they're, they're lively. But these girls are incredibly tense. So I um, started chatting with them with a health interpreter. Obviously, I know what they've been through. They've all been raped and sold into prostitution and rescued. Uh, so I, I chatted with them and then obviously we, we have camaraderie and then I asked them, well, tell me what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'll say, oh, they want to be doctors or lawyers or nurses. And I'll say, oh, why do you want to do that? And they say, oh, it's because we want to help save the world and, and help people. And I think that instance always made me like, what? You know, because it made me realize that here are these girls, eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, they've all been raped, beaten, uh, sold to prostitution, usually by their mothers, uh, parents, out of poverty or whatever reason. And, and here they are wanting to save the world in spite of their circumstances. And here we are living more privileged lives and, and we are like feeling so upset and broken. And I'm not saying that we're not entitled to our pain, we, we are, but I think sometimes when you put yourself in, other, in someone else's shoes, in the perspective of an eight-year-old who has been raped repeatedly and she wants to save the world, I'm like, I should did do more. Did it help Of you course it did. Get, okay, to It'd get be like, you know what, Loretta, at least you're not being raped and beaten on a daily basis. You've just gone through something incredibly difficult, but it's one-off and you're going to get better and you're going to get yourself stronger and you're going to make sure you're going to help everybody that you can. Because here are eight-year-olds who are completely helpless and they want to help people. And mm -hmm. here I am, uh, you know, uh, a, a well-educated um, adult and I'm like wallowing in my little grief. And I decided that's it, Loretta, snap out of it and you're gonna try and get yourself better so that you can go and help other people. Enjoyed this video? You can watch the full interview with Loretta simply by visiting this link www.yanatv.com forward slash Loretta Chen. Head over there now and spread the love and share this video with your friends. And of course, subscribe to our channel where we share weekly interviews with people who make a difference. Stay purposeful, fearless, and connected. But above all, Loretta is an extraordinary woman. Ow! Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, it's okay. <laughs>